So my name's JC. I'm a uh, clinical pharmacy specialist in hematology and oncology. I work predominantly at the Lifespan Cancer Institute at the Miriam Hospital, but I also work at Rhode Island Hospital as well. Um, I'm originally from Maine. I went to the University of Rhode Island and graduated in 2012, so almost 10 years ago now. And then um, did a couple years of residency, both in Maine, uh, in Portland, Maine, at Maine Medical Center in uh, obviously the PGY-1 and then the PGY-2 in oncology. Um, subsequent to that, uh, worked uh, in my current position. Um, and uh, on a daily basis, I, I round with the, with the um, hemonc team in the inpatient service. Uh, and then on the outpatient side, I, I follow up with patients that are on oral chemotherapies and starting new IV chemotherapies. I'm working with the building of chemotherapy treatment plans. And then on the side, kind of like, uh, you know, a bunch of committee work, uh, precepting students, precepting residents and lecturing at different universities. Wow. So I actually would love to know how you got into lecturing. I think that that's so cool that you get to come and you get to share your knowledge with all of the students. Yeah, I, I kind of, to be quite honest, like it was a, it was a large part of the reason that I did have interest in the, the role that I have now. Um, we're affiliated with a couple PA schools, physician assistant schools, um, a nurse practitioner school, obviously the College of Pharmacy, which I'm very thankful to be able to like come back to my alma mater. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, not everyone is interested in teaching and that's that's for you to decide. Um, but for me, when I was going through my residency and uh, as I started to feel like I knew a little bit more about topics, I was like, you know, I do kind of like explaining it to people. And I do like, especially now that I'm on the older side, I've, I've seen students and residents go and now they're like, you know, they're fully fledged specialists at other institutions. Some are at Sloan Kettering, some are in MD Anderson. Some of them are doing like really, really great things. And it's just amazing to see it come full circle. Um, so. Uh, I, I really did come up and take this role, not only because uh, there were a lot of other good aspects about it, but also because of the affiliations with the academic uh, uh, academic affiliations I had. Okay. Um, so when did you realize that you wanted to pursue a career in clinical pharmacy? That's a great question. Um, and I feel like my answer, honestly, would uh, it would be hard to make it these days in pharmacy school with my answer, but it was not till my P3 or P4 year. It was a last minute decision. Um, because I really didn't know much about specialization. I didn't even know what residencies were till my P2 or P3 year, which is again, unusual. I think most people, I, I literally like a year ago, I feel like there was a high schooler that told me they wanted to do a PGY2 and I think oncology and it blew my mind. Um, so uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty insane, I think. Um, I, I definitely was late to the game. I think back then I was late to the game and now compared to now, I would be very late to the game. But it was, it was, it took a it took a lecture, I believe, from Dr. Cho, if I'm not mistaken, that talked about Gleevec and the BCR able mutation. And it took a little bit of that, like turning the nerd switch on. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And deciding I wanted to do an oncology uh, rotation, it just kind of like snowballed from there. I, I did my oncology rotation. I loved it. Um, fell in love with a lot of the patients and, uh, you know, working with the medical team in that, in that regard. And then I wanted to do a residency and it kind of just it went from there. So it was, it was very organic. It never was something that I planned. Okay. Well, I do love Dr. Cho. <laughs> yeah, he still teaches all of our pharmacology. Um, I, I thought the mechanisms and all that stuff, again, it's really nerdy, but I was like, well, that's really interesting. So yeah. We're all nerds in pharmacy school. I don't think you can get to pharmacy school and not be a nerd in some form or another. <laughs> you know, in some way or another, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so you kind of talked a little bit about all of the different things that you do. Um, how does teamwork play a role in your work environment? I think that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's something that uh, I feel like URI teaches you, um, maybe directly and indirectly, but it's like life experiences that you get while you're at URI. So for example, I was a resident assistant and you know I was involved with other um, committees as well. And I think learning to play well with others is, uh, it's important no matter what you do, even if you're not, um, you know, in clinical pharmacy. Um, and, uh, but I will say my role, you know, I, I, I round with the medical team. I teach patients. I work obviously with other pharmacists um, and obviously I'm precepting students and residents. So I think choosing how you interact with them, how you communicate with them, the language you use, especially as, as you know, with patients, you, you can't be using uh, high academic vernacular. You need to be able to tone it down so that they know exactly what you're talking about. And then meanwhile, you know, switching, you, you have to be able to turn an on switch. Then when you go to the inpatient rounding team, you have to make sense with what you're talking about and not be so like vaguely nonspecific. So I think choosing your, learning to communicate with different um, providers and working well with them is, 
uh, something that URI taught me it just, it was invaluable lessons that I got throughout uh, both learning in the classroom as well as in my rotational experience. But you, you, you need that in any profession, I think. Agreed. Um, so what kind of interactions do you have with healthcare professionals from other disciplines? I know that pharmacy is very, um, very active in almost all aspects of a hospital and we kind of have our hands in a little bit of everything. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Caitlin. Um, I think, you know, I'm speaking just from my little niche window, um, but in terms of interacting with other providers from my end, uh, I do do my oral chemo teaches with other nurses. Um, so a lot of times the nurses have already gotten like their script, I've got my script. So we have to gel it together so it makes a cohesive teaching experience for the, for the patients. Um, and then, you know, they offer their expertise with a lot of like more self-care things, but then I offer expertise with, you know, drug interactions and kind of things like that. And um, I would say the same kind of like, you know, when you're, you're rounding with the medical team as well. Um, uh, not only communicating to them, but communicating at the right time. So to bring it back to something clinical, but you know, like the soap notes, if someone's going through their subjective and objective, if they, um, I, and I, I go through this a lot with my residents and students, because I think a lot of times people want to like intervene and say, oh, we should, we, we should fix that medication or change that dose, but you got to pick the right time to do it and pick your battles. Don't always, um, you know, I think low hanging fruit is important, um, but we, we want to pick like what we're intervening on every time. So, um, so that's all to say, I think communicating with other providers, you have to um, kind of, uh, you know, tailor what you say and how you say it to, to where the scenario you're in. No, exactly. It is. I think it's all about, you know, being able to switch from talking to other professionals who understand all of the jargon that we use to being able to switch and talk to a patient and explain to them, you know, what is happening or what do they need to be knowing about this medication without confusing them even more, <laughs> which yeah. I think is a great skill to learn, regardless of whether you you work in a hospital or even a community pharmacy as a student, it's, it's a little trial and error sometimes. Because <laughs> everyone's different and you don't know how they're going to take, you know, exactly what they, what they, what like was most important to them. Um, one of my PGY1 preceptors, I believe, she always told me like to focus on their core concern. And I think that's, it's important for everyone, but especially for patients, just for example, today I was talking to someone that was very focused on like the IV chemotherapy she had gotten, had given her diarrhea in the past. And now she's going on this oral chemotherapy and she's the most worried about that. So yes, I'm teaching her on other things, but we're rehashing like what the self-care and what preventative things she can do because that's her mo most important concern. So being able to read that is, I think, uh, you know, a skill that again, I think comes with time and you or I help to, to bring that about. Yeah. Um, so can you describe what it means to be board certified um, as well as the board certification process for us? Yeah. Um, so the board certification process is something that's really kicked into gear. I would say I'm like, I've, I haven't been around since it started, but I, I just have the feeling within the last five to seven years, it's become more and more important. Um, it's done by the board of pharmacy specialists, BPS. Um, it's a way of, I think, showing that you have a certain level of expertise in a specific subject area. Um, I can't speak to every specific specialty. Um, I'm not that smart, but I can tell you that, uh, the, the, for example, in an oncology setting, if you're gonna be BCOP or board certified, um, you have to do a PGY-1, you have to do a PGY-2. There's certain um, minimum like requirements that you have to have experience wise to be able to qualify. And then once you qualify, you take an exam, which is actually not all clinical. A lot of it is clinical, but there's also stuff about biostats and things about governing organizations and guidelines. And like, for me, there was even like ISO requirements for like IV lab uh, compounding and all that. So it's not all clinical. Um, which was uh, clearly something I had to study, uh, not something I had to study. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if I would pass now, but to be, <laughs> to be quite honest, like it's, a, it's a, a very comprehensive exam. So it is a lot, it is the bulk of it is clinical, but there's a lot of other stuff in there too. And um, I think it does, it, it, it serves as a way to show some level of expertise in whatever clinical area it is. So it, for me, it's oncology, but there's also critical care ID. There's a lot of other subspecialties that have that um, board certification and it's becoming more and more important in clinical pharmacy to have that um, as sort of, sort of this like uh, marker for uh, your expertise in that area I think. 
Yeah. I um, I actually know a couple of pharmacists that are looking into it or in the process of doing it. it. Like you said, it's very intensive and they keep talking about all these things. I'm like, I don't even think I learned that in school and I'm currently in school right now. So it does seem like it's quite an intensive process. It is. Um, but almost like a nice refresher. You know, everyone needs yeah. a good refresher course every now and again. <laughs> And there are good parts about it too. Like uh, there are a lot of good parts about it, but one of the good parts is like, especially the biostats, I think, um, like even to this day, even though it was like, there were some concepts that I think I had learned back in, what is it? Uh, before your P1 year, when you do biostats, I think, um, I feel like I probably learned it back then, but do I remember it? No, of course not. So when I had to study for the board certification, it was like, oh my gosh, I do remember this, but now I can apply it to something. And it's now it sticks around a lot more because again, there's like an application to it. So yes. yeah, yes, I do. I do like the application part. I think it always helps us learn a little bit better as students because then, you know, those patient cases are what truly like makes it real instead of learning about like an abstract con like context. Um, you're like, Oh, I get it now. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Totally. Agree. Big fan of patient cases. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you're involved in a lot of different areas of pharmacy as well as education. Um, but what specific projects are you working on right now? Well, um, there's, there's a number of them. Um, I'm working on some uh, projects in combination with our PGY2 residents. Um, so as, as I think a lot of people know, when you get into a residency at PGY1 or PGY2, you get uh, sort of assigned a project that you're gonna be your year long longitudinal project. Um, so I'm working with, a, um, well, actually one of them just got published. It was on uh, non-small cell lung cancer and uh, specifically looking at different types of uh, immunotherapies and whether or not steroids have an effect on it. Um, so I'm working on the current, uh, another project with another PGY2. I'm working on a case report of a pretty interesting case that we saw with a specific oral TKI, actually Gleevec, um, and a specific dosing pattern in it. Um, and uh, uh, basically it's not an FDA indicated dose, but this was like the happy medium that the patient could tolerate and they've gotten a response out of it. Um, and then a couple other uh, like projects that are more, uh, I guess, more organizational based, like things that have to do with like dosing schema or ways that we're um, trying to optimize dosing of specifically like immunotherapies, uh, which is a specific type of like cancer medication. Um, and so I would say those are some of the biggest projects that come to my head. Okay. Um, sounds like there's a couple of cool things. Um, how often do you do research or like look into investigational type things? Yeah. So I, I would say, um, so to the very first, um, uh, question you kind of asked me about like uh, teaching and all that my my love w you know when I had started my clinical pharmacy career I think had always been in teaching I never was a big uh, research was never like the, the impetus of, of why I went into clinical pharmacy um, that being said um, I do get involved with research every so often I think it's it kind of when the opportunity presents itself I don't um, it, every pharmacist is different, especially in the, when they're a pharmacy specialist, kind of like me. Some are very like research heavy um, and, you know, power to them. I, I actually am not as heavy as maybe I should be. Um, but uh, the, a lot of pharmacists are very research heavy and they're always having ongoing research. I happen to have ongoing research right now, um, but it's not always happening with me. It's kind of like, for me, it's, it, it has to be just kind of natural. Like it just, it, it um, is something that, you know, just happens either based on a case that we saw or something I'm working on with a resident. Um, but it has to be, I guess, organic is the best way for me to say it. Yeah, just kind of fall into it. Yeah, I, I do happen to fall into a lot of things. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Um, so you kind of talked a little bit about your time at URI. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about why you chose URI specifically for pharmacy school? Um, yeah, uh, a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons. Um, I'll try and start with the proximity reason, which was not the primary reason, but being from Maine at the time, there was no pharmacy school. Um, and, uh, you know, I was looking at like MCP, I was looking at URI. So first of all, I, I cast a very small net. I didn't want to go too, too far away from home. Um, and so I was looking at a lot of these New England schools. And uh, so once I had this net cast, then I kind of visited all of them and URI just it, um, it like, it hit me the right way. There were a lot of things that I liked about, like the quad is beautiful. I loved walking through the campus. Um, it wasn't, the pharmacy school that we had back then was different than the, the very beautiful building that you guys have now. <laughs> um, 
So uh, as much as I, you know, I, I love the faculty and all that, I, I can't say that the building won me over or anything like that. But <laughs> the interactions I had with like the other students and all that and their enthusiasm, the, the support system and all that. And on top of that campus, I think that won me over. On top of the fact that uh, like another non-pharmacy related uh, interest of mine was music and I wanted to do a jazz minor. And a lot of like, you know, MCP and I shouldn't name other schools. A lot of other schools that are very like pharmacy specific, you don't have the ability to do uh, or see other majors as much. And I wanted to have a little bit of a, a wider net in that regard, like seeing other majors and having exposure to other people with other uh, lines of uh, walks of life, I guess. And so, um, so URI was, was perfect for me. Um, and uh, so that's why I chose URI. Love that. Um, I always think it's kind of cool how other people found this school. So I was... I came from the Midwest. So I came from Illinois and I actually moved 17 hours for school because I loved URI so much. Like it was just one of those things that I was on my tour. And at the end of my college tour, my mom looks at me and she goes, really? She was like this one. Like it was just written all over my face how much I love the campus. Like you said, I, I did my tour during the summer. So of course it was beautiful. The quad was nice and green. <laughs> Thank you so much. But it was, I think like the campus is really big. And also the, uh, the attraction of being able to do something outside of pharmacy school was huge for me. Like I did say, I am, um, I am a double major with French, um, but I am supposed to ask you about your involvement with music in your time at URI. I, um, I heard a rumor that you used to play the piano at South Bay. I was, I mean, up until, uh, not to bring a Debbie Downer to it, but I was up until COVID hit. I, I was playing almost every month at South Bay, uh, Brookdale. Brookdale off of, I can't remember the name of the road, but you know, on the way to the news and the downtown area of Wakefield. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I started there in 2010. So it had been 10 years uh, wow. last year. And uh, yeah, so I, I you know, um, I, I did go to URI partly, like I said, because of pharmacy and partly because of the music thing. And then this music thing kind of like fell onto my lap. I was doing my geriatric selective with uh, Dr. Estes. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, it's, it's one of the, for me, it's one of the funniest stories because so about five years ago when I started work back here, um, one of the elderly people that I had been in touch with since 2010, um, after, my, after I started back here and I started playing back at South Bay, um, one of the uh, uh, residents there at the South Bay area of Brookdale was asking me why I had started playing there and I couldn't remember. And my resident friend that I had been my patient case five years back I uh, was like, oh, I dressed up like a chicken. It was Halloween. I forced him to play the piano. I was like, oh my God, she's right. Like she had a better memory than I did about why I started. <laughs> so it was adorable. Um, and it reminded me exactly why I love playing there. So I'm hoping that once things ease up a little bit, I can go back to playing there. But I do try to go there once a month, not only because I love South County, but also because I love all the residents there. I think that's so cool. I... I love that. So doing our service learning with Dr. Estes, she's the one that runs all of those where we do our 40 hours of community involvement. Um, I think that was such a cool part of our program. Um, I, I'm not quite as dedicated as you are. I didn't go play the piano. Um, but I was involved with the organization that I did my um, service learning with for a couple of years. Um, I just really liked what they were about. It was working with um, high school students and middle school students. So I I got to do a little bit more of like that pediatric um, kind of involvement, you know, going in and talking to students about vaping and, you know, why study drugs are not maybe the best thing to be doing if you don't have a prescription. So things like that. So it was just, That's really I awesome. loved it. Um, and I, I do. I, and Dr. S, if she, when as soon as you were like, yes, I'd love to do the interview, she's like, oh my gosh, ask him about South Bay. She got so excited. She was like, um, but I think that's so cool. Um, and I think it truly does show maybe not the dedication, but like just the involvement that we have and the lasting effect that like URI has on us as students, um, that even after you've graduated 10 years down the road, you're still coming back and still going and, um, seeing all of the residents. I think that's so cool. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there are many things that obviously still affect me, uh, from URI, but that's one of the ones that's like closest to my heart. Just that it's been 10 I'm hoping soon I can resume soon, but uh, like just to see all their faces, like watching you play, just, it also makes me feel young again too. Just I, <laughs> I remember starting in 2010 and it's like now it's been 10 years, but, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's lovely to see my friends there. 
That's so cool. <laughs> um, did you do, were you involved in anything else during your time at URI? Anything like, um, we have a lot of community of, or college of pharmacy organizations. Were you involved in anything like that? I was involved in, I think it was the student version of ASHP. Um, and I was mm -hmm. involved a little bit with ASCAP. Um, honestly, I should have probably been a little bit more involved than I was, but those were the two that I really was mostly involved with. Um, mm -hmm. I, outside of the pharmacy, I was like doing, pursuing the jazz minor and also doing a, like resident assisting. A re I was a resident advisor in, in a couple of the dorms. Um, so that was pretty much how I spent my time. But in, as far as pharmacy goes, it was mostly those two organizations that I was involved with. Okay. Um, yeah, everyone kind of has a little bit different. Which, uh, which dorms were you in RA in? I was in Butterfield and Adams. Is, I don't even know if Adams is still open. It is. It is still there. Believe it or not, <laughs> every time I'm kind of surprised um, that it's still there. Still Were you in Butterfield when it had the um, when it had the dining hall in the bottom? Oh my gosh. Uh, so yes, but I actually I was in Browning. I was in Butterfield. That's. Oh, <laughs> I was like, yeah. So Butterfield no longer has a dining hall. It does. Oh. It does. They just came in. They updated it. Um, and I had a friend that lived there our freshman year and we'd always be like hanging out in her room and like, you could just smell all the food. And I was like, I would have gained way more weight my freshman year than I did had I lived in Butterfield because I would have just had to go eat every time they started cooking. Yeah, I do miss those like walk in, swipe your card and just grab, or I don't know if you swipe your card anymore, but whatever it was to get your meal and just like, oh, I could use a buffet. <laughs> Uh, I was just talking to, um, I was doing a tour uh, for an uh, um, admitted student and I was telling her about how we used to go for, it was mozzarella stick and buffalo wing day. <laughs> and it was like mott stick and wings and you knew it was like butt nugs or butt sticks. Like I was like, oh, it's like, that's the day. <laughs> it had, I think it had the best food <laughs> and I, um, I, I keep like waiting. Them. What was that? I like their cookies, their chocolate chip cookies. I can still picture the taste. They did it uh, on the top in the M and M cookies. Those were good too. Mm, we used to take the um, like go to the, like the the frozen yogurt machine, and we do like the frozen yogurt on one cookie, and then put another on top, and have our own like ice cream sandwiches. Wow! <laughs> I think we were a little spoiled. <laughs> but oh yes, it's um, it's insane. I always. Uh, I always love finding younger students because I'm like, oh, you should use a guest swipe and like, we'll go out for dinner and we'll go to, we'll go to Butterfield. Yeah. You treat me. I mean, just use your guest swipe. Right. I'm like, here, I'll send you my study guide for this exam. And then I want to swipe into Butterfield. Okay. Right. I'll, we'll trade study guides for butt nugs. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, if I have any study guides, I'll start looking around, see if I can get a couple swipes in there. It's been years since I've been at Butterfield. <laughs> it's um, it's a little different right now. They um, they're not allowed to eat in Butterfield, so they have to do like grab and go meals. Um, due to COVID, they don't want them to be congregating. Oh, of course, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm waiting. Once it's open, I'm gonna find some. I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> Just keep keep some keep some younger friends, and I'm sure you'll be able to get in eventually. Exactly. <laughs> kind of hard though the older we get the more I'm like I don't know anybody <laughs> uh, you're telling me I don't know I don't think I know any student anymore so <laughs> besides like interns and all that you know but yeah yeah um all right so my this is of course my favorite question is what is your best advice for students looking to pursue a pharmacy degree at URI best advice <laughs> a, I think there's a lot to say um I think if you're pursuing your degree at URI, you've already made the, the most important decision, which you chose an amazing school um, with a lot of really, really good opportunities. I don't think, uh, I don't think any school is gonna teach you all of the life lessons or I wouldn't say life lessons, all the academics and clinical knowledge you're ever gonna know. Cause no one, I don't even know all the clinical knowledge I should know. Like you're always, always gonna grow in that way, but URI just does such a good job of opening your mind changing the way you think about things um, and, and just getting you to work together with other people well. So I, I would just say, keep your mind open. Um, don't uh, silo yourself into something too early. Don't think uh, that, that, you know, that there's a certain path for you and that's the only option. I would say, keep your options open. Uh, the, the obvious things aside, studying hard and all that stuff is just keep your options open, keep your mind open. Cause um, you, I, I don't think you always know that early on exactly what you want to do.
Exactly.